Wow. So I really like the emotion in that is to say, you know, it's all about the worship for me, right? You get caught up in a moment and you get emotional about something. When you hear something like, you know, the hopelessness of what it would be for someone to take their own life, that's pretty serious. And the hope that's found in Jesus is really big. Amen? Well, welcome. I'm glad you're here and the opportunity to just once again have an evening to just take a look at and consider what God might want to do in and through your life. Amen? So I ask a question all the time about, you know, do you want to be a disciple? I ask that because it's a very serious question. You know, there's implications that go with that. Do you want to be a disciple? And a lot of people say yes to it and without even considering remotely of what it just got said. Um, without considering that God has a call on our lives and that we respond to that call or we don't respond to it. Amen? I mean, you have decisions to make in this life every day. And based on those decisions, they're, it's going to navigate the journey of life. And incidentally, we had a young man that came and was doing community service today. And uh, he's got issues. He's got issues. <laughs> to say the least, he's got issues. Uh, and we want to help him, though. We want to help him. I thought Brother Dave was going to, you know, his eyeballs were going to pop out of his head. Because he hears something in this guy. And if somebody doesn't stand at the crossroad for this guy and change the course that he's on, he's in trouble. He's in big trouble. And so I'm, I'm watching Brother Dave. He's like, man, I was going to say this to this kid. I was going to say this. I was going to say this. And I'm like, well, why don't you? Well, that was probably not the right thing for me to say. Because Dave came out there and he had, you know, he had the throttle turned up on the message a little bit. About, about scared this guy to death. However, he heard him. And then I was able to come in there and we worked together with him and we started to have a conversation say, listen, this world will eat you alive. And there's people that don't care. And, and the reason that you're with us right now is somebody cared enough for you and brought you through the channels, through the legal system, and sent you right to us. You need to consider that because a lot of the people in the, in the judicial system, you're another name or a number. And you're gonna get, they're going to eat you alive. But you're here today, and we want to try to do something with you, but you're going to have to understand something. You're going to have to embrace what's happening in your life right now, and, and we're going to help you. Well, the kid got an attitude adjustment, and, and quite frankly, I think he might, he might embrace what's going on. I, I didn't think it was going to go that way for a little bit as we were getting started, but the truth of it is, is that Brother Dave was looking at this young man, and I'm sure in something that he saw in the, this guy and the attitude and everything, he probably saw characteristics of his own attitude at one point in his life. It's like, man, you don't want to go down those roads. You don't want to. Not, not only because the, of the, the turmoil that they bring, but God has something planned that's so much uh, better and has purpose. You know, and I've seen God work in this week. It was an amazing week. We got to share of this men's breakfast, and, and I get to bring a message uh, for the men's breakfast because our senior pastor is out working at one of the schools, this Grace Schools that are uh, opening up this fall and, it, you know, just around the corner. And so he's out uh, working on this project, and so I'm bringing this message. And a, and a burden on my heart is that we need to partner with what's going on. At some point, we have to see ourselves as a participant in what God's doing. Amen. So if, you, if you've been rescued and you understand that, if you don't understand that, I get it. This is just, I'm speaking in another language to you. But if you get it, then, then something happens and, and then it's, this journey becomes very real and you get emotional like Tim did. And if you don't know that when we did Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames, uh, that Tim, his first encounter with us, Tim came through us the same way, amen, brother? He came to us doing community service. And the Lord got a hold of him. He actually, he's, he's got a drama background. And uh, so he played, of all people, he played Satan in our Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames. Did a smoking job. And we were sitting in the next room and we're having a, something to eat between uh, practice and actual production of what was going to go on in here. And I asked him a question. said, you want to meet that guy? Do you want to meet that guy on your own? Or you, you, 
you want Jesus to represent you because that's reality. This is, it's a drama, but you're representing something that's very real. And incidentally, Tim got saved. Amen? So Satan got saved in the, in the drama. Amen? That, that was awesome. It was awesome. But there was something really dramatic that happened because now we see something different in his character. We watched the growth. Drew's another one. I brag on him all the time. But this week was a week that, you know, he's become somebody to his grandson. And, and you know, he's talking about this this morning in our men's breakfast about, you know, leaving the hospital and, and giving these vouchers to some other guy that's there. And his kids had his, his appendix blew up. And the kid's been there for three weeks. The dad's beat to death. And Drew's wanting to give him these food vouchers to, you know, to lighten his load in some way. And long story short, so he's able to hook up and do that. And then Dean in the elevator, as they're ready to leave, says he's looking at his prize pillow, his prize pillow, and says, maybe I need to give this pillow to this kid. I'm going to tell you something. If you don't get the emotion in, the, in, in what just got said there, is that this little one, by the example of Drew, was... Do you hear what I'm saying? Listen, that's a change. It's not, he didn't wake up one morning and say, I want to be this different guy. He is a product of what Christ produces in a life that's surrendered to him. Amen? And, and others do likewise. They're inspired and it brings them to this place where um, there's this change that can, that can occur, but make no mistake, there's an opposing force, right? The devil comes to what? Kill steal and destroy, right? And so that there's an, this battle that's raging. And when you see the lives of these young people that we stand and we represent here in the academy and, of course, through the church and through all the ministries, we stand in the gap. And, and of course, there's an opposing force that would like to lie to you, right? To steal your joy, to tell you you're nothing and you'll never amount to anything. And it's a lie out of hell because God has a plan for your life. And, and there's an opposing force that's going to tell you another story. And so as a result of it, you, when you understand it, then you embrace these things. You'll see somebody like Tim that gets worked up and emotional because he understands what it is to be freed, redeemed, rescued from this place that you cannot rescue yourself from. But we get lost in it in this world, don't we? The, the devil comes lying in our ears, and, and then there's a lot of people that will join with him and tell you a lot of different things. So I've got something for you tonight, and I've preached on this passage before and made different points, but I really felt compelled tonight because, you know, what, what I'm talking about is what, what we're missing in the church are true disciples of Jesus, are true disciples of Jesus that understand that everything that goes wrong in your life isn't God, the big killjoy, putting his thumb on you. It's an opposing force of all of hell's fury trying to stomp out a movement of God. And so for us to embrace that, you've you got to understand some things. We've got to adjust our attitude to get in alignment so that we can see things differently than we see them on our own. Right? Amen? So I was talking about in our men's uh, devotion this week about embracing a message, right, or begrudging a message. Embracing or begrudging. What a difference in attitude, amen? Where all of a sudden, you know, you're hearing something and it may go against the grain of what you would ordinarily think or do, but you embrace it because you know that God is going to do something through it. Or you can begrudgingly deal with it, amen? and say, I'm not interested, and I deal with it in contempt. And, and, and in what, there's no power in that. In fact, we succumb to the lies of the devil because why? Because we buy what he's selling. So tonight, we're going to start out in Matthew chapter 7. I just want to just touch on this to get started, verse 1 through 6. Verse 1 through 6 says, do not judge or you'll be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you'll be judged. And with the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. 
Then it goes on and says, <clears throat> why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye? Pay no attention to the plank in your own eye. And how can you say to your brother, let me help you with the speck in your eye, and all the time have a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your eye, and then you'll be able to see clearly to move the speck in your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet, in turn, and tear you to pieces. Start out with this judging thing, this judging thing, or you'll be judged with the same measure. And that's what you hear all the time. If you, if you want to be a disciple of Jesus, you know, you, you come to this place that you say, I want to hear what God has to say. And you know what? Here's a revelation for you. He uses the church to speak into your life. He uses brothers and sisters in the Lord to speak into your life, as well as the scriptures, the Holy Spirit of God, circumstances, and of course, the church, right? And so that is the, the biggest you know, red flag in, in our lives, if you say you want to be a disciple, a disciple and then you, you come up with this, don't judge me. Don't judge me. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Somebody's getting personal with you. They're saying, hey, listen, I've noticed this is going on. You may not be aware of it, but that's a slippery slope. You want to stay away from that, right? Don't judge me. Well, guess what? The scripture doesn't say not to judge as in, well, you're going to be judged with the same measure that you use, right? With the same measure that you use. Going on to talk about the sawdust and the plank, and I preached a message on just that, where I was talking about this, this concept. You can imagine how crazy it is if you're looking at uh, somebody else's life, and, and I want to be an inspiration in their life, and there's things that are critically wrong in my life, Right? You know, the first time I ever heard somebody really give me uh, some insight into this particular uh, scripture was not by using the scripture, but it was a life lesson. I was a newer believer and I was on a spiritual journey and I was running from God and didn't know I was running from God. I was at a church that confronted issues in my life. I didn't like what I was hearing. So I found issues wrong with them. Sound familiar, anybody? So I found issues wrong with them. I had beefs with them, you know, the discrepancies. In reality, what was happening is I was being confronted. And so I'm running, I'm running from God because he's confronting. He's, he's, he's doing something in my life to change from the way I was, the way that I thought, into a character to look more Christ-like by taking off the old and putting on the new and so when some of the old had to be confronted, somebody's mouth has to say it, right? And so as a result, I'm speaking to this guy. I'm having an issue. And you know what he says to me? I would never miss praying before a meal. I'd never miss praying before a meal. <clears throat> and I started to pray, and he said, why don't you quit praying before the meal and take care of the business in your life? <whistles> Powerful words. And I heard him, and I heard him clear. What he was saying is, hey, listen, listen, in my life, I've got the plank out of my eye. You seem to be able to see the circumstances in my life, because what I had said to him, he, he wasn't praying before he was eating his meal, right? He was just diving in, and he was just going to eat without praying. And so, of course, legalistically, coming from the background that I came from, I noticed right away you didn't give thanks for your food. And he said, well, why don't you worry about... Why don't you, but what he's saying is, why don't you get the plank out of your eye and not worry about the splinter in my eye until you take care of that? Man, and I heard it. I heard it loud and clear. It was delivered. It was delivered in love. It wasn't, a, it wasn't some arrogant person that was trying to say things to hurt me. It was somebody that said, I see something, and you're going to have to address it. You're going to have to address it, because if you ever want to have a voice to deal with that, the splinter, the little sliver. Maybe God might use you to help get slivers out of eyes, but you got to get that stinking diving board out of your eye. Amen? Amen? And so that's where we find ourselves. We get offended and we find ourselves, uh, you know, defensive. Well, God used, he was an old friend of mine. I grew up with him. It was crazy because in, the, in our, you know, folly of our youth, we partied together all the time and 
craziest thing is the Lord rescued both of us, that different people led us to the Lord, and we came back together on our journeys of life, and boy, the Lord really tagged me with words from my buddy's mouth, right? And, and I heard them. But then there's something else in this passage, in verse 6, where it says, Do not give dogs what is sacred, and do not throw pearls to pigs. If you do, they'll trample them under their feet and turn around and tear you to pieces. And that's one of those things where, you know, when I say, do you want to be a disciple? Do you want to be a disciple? Because, you know, interestingly, that passage right there, that verse, rather, uh, is translated literally. It's not, do not give to dogs. It's never. Never would be a literal translation. As in, don't do it, ever. As in, when you run into somebody that you, you have these questions that you ask people, you know, you're on a spiritual journey, you're, you're coming together, you come in this place, and if you're coming in here, you're going to get it. Amen? Amen? If you're coming in this room, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you about the Scriptures. I'm going to say, listen, these are not options. They're reality, and if you embrace them, they'll change your life, or you could ignore them. But make no mistake, if you come in and God confronts you, and then you get hostile, hostile to me, you know what happens? You know what happens? What do you think? Anybody? No? I don't hit you, Drew. No. <laughs> Drew's like, club. No, that's not it. No, I quit talking to you. Do you hear what I'm saying? What's the scripture say? Never cast your pearls before the swine. Meaning if it's, if it's something that somebody's going to take the sanctification process of God, which means, you know what that is? The sanctification process of God is when, when the scriptures are broken before you and you partake of the scripture, you, you digest what God is saying, you make the adjustments and you have wisdom that comes through the journey of life. When that process is occurring in your life and you come to somebody else who does not comprehend those things and you lay them out like a banquet before them and they stomp them under their feet, God says, never do that. Do not give what is sacred to pigs. That's strong language, folks. I didn't say it, God did. Meaning that there's a place and time in our life we're not ready to hear those truths. We're not ready to comprehend the magnitude of investment that is there when somebody allows the Spirit of God to speak in and through their life to the point it transforms them. And when you share that with somebody, they stand to grow expeditionally. They grow largely, quickly, and they, they grow at your expense because you've done the investing and they benefit on the profit. Amen? But that's a hard thing to comprehend. If you find yourself being resistant when you hear something, our pastor that passed away, Pastor Clark, was a mentor of mine, and he spoke some truths that I, that I treasure. They're worth their weight in gold. He used to say this. He'd say, listen, anything that you hear coming from somebody that you know is, is walking with the Lord, it doesn't matter if they're, maybe they're having a bad day, and they serve it up on a terrible platter. You need to listen to what they said, make application of anything applicable, and discard the rest. Amen? That's a pretty safe way to deal with it. Amen? So when you get me and I've got one of my attitude problems, and my tone sounds terrible, kind of sounds like a club, right, Drew? And when it's like that, then you say, okay, all right, I don't like the delivery, but there's some truth in what I heard. All right? And so I'm going to embrace it because... There's truth in what I heard, and I can't deny it. It's, it's like looking at your face in a mirror, and, and you see the truth. It's right there in front of you. You can't deny it. It's a fool that denies the truth of God. Amen? Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 and following to 12 is, uh, says this, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, anyone who seeks finds, and anyone who who knocks, the door will be open. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, would give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, would give him a snake? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more 
Would your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. This sums up the law of the prophets. Wow. Really interesting. I really love this. Ask, and it'll be given to you. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, and the door will be opened, and all that. I was thinking of Drew this week, um, as God just blessed him and and, and had provisions for him, as he's taken on this uh, responsibility of of rearing his grandson right now. Of course, he didn't he didn't bid for that job, but he's got it. Amen. And so, of course, then his appendix uh, explodes. Now you've got a critical situation going on, and and so you got to deal with that. And you got in the expense of being in the city and, and having meals and parking, and it was like $60 a day or something for parking or whatever. And, and Brother Drew calls and says, hey, listen, um, can somebody drive me back? He's, he's trying to come up with a plan. I said, you know what, Drew, you know what? It's an amazing thing to be able to have a teachable moment. Amen? Because, you know, the Scripture the scripture says, James chapter 4, verse 2b uh, in 3 says this, uh, you do not have because you do not ask. When you ask, you don't receive because you ask with the wrong motives. You might spend it on yourself, right? And I said, but Drew, you know what happens when you ask with the right motives? Right? What? He provides. he provides, doesn't he? Doesn't he take care of you? You ask, it will be given to you, Right? You ask, you say, hey God, I just want to take care of this youngster. I want to be here for him unconditionally. I don't have the resources to do it. God, I, I'm going to need some, I need somebody to stamp my parking ticket here, right? And when you ask, and it's not in a selfish manner, it's not because you want to go out and buy a 12-pack with the money for parking. That's not what you're saying. It's like, I don't have it. I can't do it. And God comes through, amen? It's an amazing thing. To, to be living in that, but Brother Randy was a, a brother. Brother uh, Andy was a, a inspiration this week in seeing God working in and through these things. Matthew seven thirteen and fourteen says this: Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter it through it. But small is the gate, narrow is the road that leads to life, and few find it. And few find it. Well, one of the problems with that, right there. They don't find it because they ain't looking. Amen? They ain't looking. Why does the, the, the road, why does the gate and the road that leads to destruction and many enter therein? And boy, I'll tell you what, on this journey of life as a disciple of Jesus, you know, you can look at the roads that are out there in life and there's a lot of them, Amen? And you have a lot of choices to be involved in or to, or to withdraw from. And to be a disciple, you have to understand, you know, that wide, wide are the roads. Wide is this pathway, right, that leads to death. That's reality. Leads to destruction leads to a course of life that sometimes has consequences that are, that are giant and they don't go away real easy. But God always gives us this opportunity. There's a crossroad. We can get back onto this narrow road, right? You can get on the narrow road and few find it. But you know what the scripture says? If you seek him with all your heart, he'll be found to you. Amen? So thinking about what does God want to do in your life if you can really get your mind wrapped around what he wants to do? To understand, it's not, it's not putting yourself in an environment to hear things that you want to hear, right? We talked about that this week. You know, stop confronting us with the Holy One of Israel. You know, prophesy illusions, all this nonsense. The reality of it is, is that God gives to us the truth of his word. We get it through the Bible. We get it through the Holy Spirit of God. We get it through the church, right? And through circumstances that he communicates to us and we can accomplish great things. But make no mistake, when your ear starts turning to your own desires and you try to use scripture to justify your actions, you're in trouble, folks. You hear what I'm telling you? It's delusional. Listen to this, Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 through 20 says this, 
Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you'll recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but every bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree, tr a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you'll recognize them. Right? I used a scripture this morning um, talking about Pastor Randy and, and him being out there on the front line of, of getting these schools ready, these grace schools ready, uh, in, in working and in looking for teammates to really join him. And I just felt compelled to just say, guys, are we behind what's going on or are we not? Right? I use this Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. It says, Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Right? By the fruit of his life. Look at what's happening. Do you see lives changing? Right? Remember John when he was in prison? Right? And he was freaking out because... You know, he was afraid for his life, and he hears all this excitement is going on, and Jesus is out there on the scene, and all these things are happening, but he's not springing him, right? And he says this, he says, you know, are you the one, or shall we look for another? And Jesus said, the, the dead are raised, right? The sick are healed, right? All this whole list of things. Make no mistake, do you not see God at work at Families of Faith Church? Hello? Amen. Hello? Somebody from the booth? I got an amen from up there. Amen? They got a pulse up there. Amen? So if you've been around here, and, you, and listen, it doesn't take you very long. Walk down the school co the corridors when school's in session and watch those children. And if, if, you don't, if you're not brought to tears, you, there's something wrong with you. If you don't understand what's going on in this world today, and this is a triage center to plastic surgery. You hear what I'm telling you? This is like a mass unit, and we deal with everything in between. Because we're on call for the Lord, and that's what it is. And, and as a result of it, we understand, listen, if you just look at the fruit of what's been produced over many years, do you hear what I'm saying? Not in the last six months. I'm talking about over a decade. Look back and say, what is the evidence of what is occurring here? And then say, I, 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 do I want to be part of that? And if I want to be part of it, then how do I get in the trenches with you? So I don't want to watch it like a program on television. I want to be part of what's happening. Amen? I say, do you want to be a disciple? Oh, we're getting serious now up there, guys. Amen? We're getting serious now. Listen to this. Now it's getting hairy. Okay? Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. It says, listen. This is talking about a true or a false disciple. Right? True or false disciple, listen. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. And then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from you, you evildoers. Wow. All right, guys. Does that shake you up a little bit? Huh? It always has shook me up, but now I'm getting older and I'm realizing something. I'm realizing something. When I say, do you want to be a disciple? This is talking about true or, or, or false disciples, right? So listen. So I guess then I have to tell you, I'm going to, I, I'm going to give you a definition of disciple. Amen? Yeah? All right. Don't run out. Guys, lock them back doors. Seriously, don't run out. It's going to get hairy right now. Just listen to what I'm saying all the way through. Do not get up out of your seat and try to bail out. Luke chapter 14, verse 26 and following. If anyone comes to me and does not listen, hate not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters. Yes, 
even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Okay, let me just give you a, like, okay. Hang on. There's a lot more than that. But that one's hairy, isn't it? You get shocked in your seat. Now, this is a New Living Translation adds this insight to the text. New, Liv New Living Trans uh, Translation gives this insight to the text. It says, in comparison, your love for Christ needs to look as hate to them. Right? Okay? So hang on. We'll continue. You know what? I'm just going to tell you something. I hate insight like that. Add it to the text. Take the full blunt of it as we get started, and let's hear it as we go through. We'll sort through it at the end. Amen? Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost and see if you have enough money to complete it, or if you lay a foundation, you're not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one who is coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, will he not send delegation while... They are still a long way off and will seek terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Right, so forget the disclaimers. Let's let the weight of that sink in. Let the weight of it sink in. Just to get really serious because I watched emotion in Brother Tim over there, I watched emotion in him when, when he was dealing with, you know, thinking about something that God has delivered him from and he wants that to be experienced by another, right? Wants to be able to, somebody to be submerged in that. You know what, what it generates? It generates something that tells me, you know, I, I've gone to, to family get-togethers and my family, the, they like to be um, to get together and, uh, and just enjoy each other's company, right? And we're getting older now, so they like to do that and so on and so forth. And they, they'll go and they'll spend a week at a, a, a motel and hang out together, and, I, and I'll tell them, listen, I've got a, a day for you. I've got a day, and if that's if, it's if we can break away, I've got a day for you, and we'll catch up in heaven, right? You hear what I'm telling you? Because I don't have that kind of time to be sitting around uh, and splashing in a pool and talking about when we were a kid. We'll, I'll do that. I'll sit, at, I'll sit at the waterside in heaven and we'll talk until the cows come home. Because I've got a calling and that calling says this, I love you guys and that is not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is when I look into the eyes of a little child that's going to be sitting in a public school because I, I was splashing around in a pool, I'll give up my past. You hear what I'm telling you? when I realize that there's a calling that, that my dedication to the one who redeemed me screams my name, I hear it, and I can do nothing but pursue it. That, that's what this passage is talking about. It's talking about to be that disciple, I heard that call. And I'm not putting on something, this is who I am. And what I'm saying is to consider what it is to be a disciple is to get past the roadblocks that happen when we hear you must hate your family, whatever, what kind of God would want to make you hate? What is he saying? He's saying that every time that there's an opportunity to be his hands, his feet, his voice in this world, we've got an excuse and it's got one of those people tied to it. Amen? You've got some kind of an excuse that you're going to put in there. You're going to insert it, and you're going to give good reason. It's like the wedding supper that's described in Scripture, where all these people, I bought cattle, I'm a new, newly wed, right? I bought land, i got to do all these things. Jesus said, surely none of them will be partake in that banquet. So when you think in terms of what it is to be a disciple, boy, that's something you really want to think about, right? It's really important. And we got to understand that God wants to do something with your life, but you're going to have to really get it. So now we come to this place where I want to tie this in a bow and have you consider 
in context what we've talked about tonight. It's found back in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 and following. The words of Jesus, all of those things that I spoke to you about, right? You get it? All the different things, judging others and uh, the, the seeking Him, right? And, and uh, the uh, widen the narrow gates. And, you know, you get this, this pursuit that's where there's a competitive uh, pull on us to live in the world and of the world or to be a disciple, which means we lay our life aside as we knew it, right? We give up this life as we knew it to pick up the life that he intended us to live, which is really the life that's abundantly provided for us. Listen to this. Verse 24 and following says, Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like the wise man who built his house on the rock, the rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against the house, and yet it did not fall, because it had, it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain came down, and the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority, listen to this, and not as the teachers of the law. Well, he did have authority, didn't he? He wasn't giving them a list of rules or, or things, the do's and don'ts of life. He's simply saying the life that you're called to live here as a disciple, you build your house on the rock and Jesus is the rock. Because what happens in this life is we go through year after year after year and everything that we invest in is built up on a substandard foundation. And when the pressures of life come, guess what happens? It comes apart, doesn't it? You been there? Where you're building, you think, I, I, I don't need God anymore. You might not even think that. It's just that life gets busy and things happen and you're moving along and the next thing you know, you're building away and I'm adding rooms and I'm going up with the structure and my life just looks like it's all that. Until the storms of life come in. Right? The storms of life come in and the structure comes crumbling down. And we find out that we've been building on a foundation that's substandard. You want to know what the, the, the best part of this is? You know, it sounds awful. It's like, wow, everything's ruined. Well, let me just tell you something. The best thing that can happen if you're on a substandard foundation and you have a structure is you don't just keep investing in the structure because it is inevitable. The scripture says when it comes down, it comes down with a great crash. Praise God. Load it up in some dumpsters and get it out of there and build on the rock. You hear what I'm telling you? So considering the whole passage, the entirety of the passage is to say, you know, to consider those things, that the person who takes heed to what they're hearing, right there, Matthew chapter 7. You can read through it when you go home. Read Matthew chapter 7. You read through there and say, if I take heed to these things, Right? I'll be the one that's house is built on the rock and when the storms come in life, it doesn't matter what's happening. I'm on the rock. Right? And so when the game ends suddenly, right? When the game ends suddenly, you're on the rock. Right? When you're in the middle of a heartache or crisis or whatever, you're on the rock. Immovable. So in other words, I'm not wishy-washy, I'm not being battered by the, the adversary of God. Why? Because I've got a firm foundation underneath me. But when I've stepped off that, when I've moved to another place, guess what? I find instability. I find, I find a place of hopelessness, Tim. I find a place of hopelessness where I might consider taking my own life. Why? Because I look at all this that I've built and it's coming crashing down. So I don't know who I'm speaking to tonight, but let me just tell you something. That the good news in that is, the good news is, is, is the Lord's ready to build it right back up on a firm foundation. Right. And the, the amazing thing is, is all we have to do is turn our heart toward him. 
We turn our heart toward him and then you don't move from that place. You don't move from that place. Immovable. After you've done everything to stand, what? Stand firm. What? Stand firm. Don't move. Stand firm. In other words, you're on the rock foundation. It's immovable. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Nobody is going to change that. After you've done everything to stand, the devil's going to say, just get off that place. Get off that place. Get off that place. That God, he's not doing nothing for you. Are you kidding me? Get off that foundation. Get off that foundation because he knows this. When you stand on that foundation, you are immovable and the house is not coming down. But when you get to the point that you buy the lies of the devil, what do you do? You step off onto that sand. And the further you step off, he keeps alluring you and alluring you further away into the place there's no stability underneath you at all anymore. And then the storms are coming. And his desire, his desire is to kill, steal, and destroy. Praise God that Jesus came to give life and give it abundantly. The victory's already been won. The foundation has already been laid. And his name's Jesus. There's a mission, folks. There's a mission that he wants you to be involved in. And there's people's lives that, that are depending on us being the voice of God in a godless world. To stand on the foundation when the world wants to put you off in the sand. Listen, I'm telling you, there's going to be one day you're going to have an audience of one, and it's going to be God himself. And we're going to give an account for everything that happened in the flesh, everything that's said and done. And there's going to be plenty of wood, hay, and stubble, as the scripture says, that'll be when you stepped off the foundation and you were on the sand. And let that burn up. Let it burn up before him. Because when the blaze goes down and you've stood back on that foundation, guess what? When the blaze burns down, you're going to see what was done for the glory of God on the foundation that's immovable. Amen? Let it start today. Let it start right now, today. So God, I don't want no more of this getting on the, out in the sand. I don't want no more of, of buying the lies of the devil where I do the wrong thing. I didn't consider what it was to be a disciple. You know, as a tower, I didn't consider the cost. Well, what's the cost? The cost is I let go of my life in the pursuits of the things that I was pursuing. And I, I lay it down at the foot of the cross. And I say, God, I want to take up the life that you've given me. That's going to require me to walk by faith, not by sight. I'm going to have to surround myself with people who are going to care about what God wants in my life and they're going to speak truth to me when I don't want to hear it. Maybe sometimes you will want to hear it. But it's consistent and it's unfailing and it's, it's the journey we're called to live. But I don't know where you're at tonight and counselors, if you'd come on up. And so we have an opportunity right here tonight to make a difference right? We can say, you know what? I want to get in the game, God. I want to get in the game. I want, to, I want to be who you've called me to be, and I don't want to be standing on no shifting, stinking ground anymore. God, would you give me the willingness to have a commitment to say that I am no longer going to be wishy-washy. I'm going to consider the cost, and I'm going to stand on that rock foundation. Help me, God. To let it be a reality. If you've never had a time that you've come and ask the Lord Jesus to forgive you, and that's where the journey begins. If you've not done it, you need to do it today. And if you have done it, let's get it right with God. Amen? As the music plays, would you come?
Father God, we thank you for this time, and God, thank you that you love us like you do, and God, thank you for Jesus, who was so selfless. He gave us the opportunity to be motivated by his love, and God, then to be used to show your love to this world, and God, I just pray that you'd help us, help us break through all the things that shackle us, help us to realize you've already set us free. God, help us to walk in that freedom in Christ. We want to accomplish your great purpose. And so, God, I pray that you'd give us, give us clarity as we press forward. Let it be so. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. You're dismissed.